hidden near the small provincial town of Cansay in the southwestern corner of France is a time capsule that links two unique species. One is modern human, us, and the other our long lost cousins, the Neanderthal. What have we learnt from history? Perhaps our lives are more intertwined than we first believed. With a team led by Professor Uri Soresi from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, some answers are there waiting to be found by students embarking on new archaeological careers in a story that's 400,000 years in the making. This is Neanderthal Legacy. Why do I dig? Uh, first of all, because I love it, because it's exciting and you never know what you're going to find. I think this is something that's really, really exciting. So every time you scrape your trowel across that dirt, something could pop up that could change our image of the past immensely in ways very childlike almost. I mean, playing with dirt and it's, I think for me, a really nice mixture of childlike curiosity with cutting edge science. One of our main projects is located in France, in the small village of Quincy. And that is why there, there is a cave which was inhabited, we think, by some of the latest Neanderthals. The core of our research at the cave is to reconstruct what happened in between now, today, and the moment when Neanderthals left the cave. That was 40,000 years ago. So in between us today and 40,000 years ago, many things happen. And our job is mostly and mainly extract this filter that time put on what the Neanderthals left at the cave. Because our hypothesis is that 40,000 years ago, Neanderthals did meet with Homo sapiens, with the first modern humans coming into Europe, and that this is this meeting, those interactions that contributed to the success of Homo sapiens. And we also hypothesize that this is why today we are still carrying Neanderthal genes. So this is that bit of history that happened 40,000 years ago that we want to reconstruct and for which that specific cave in France is uh, unique. What we do is teamwork. One archaeologist alone cannot, cannot do much because our discipline is extremely diverse. We are studying humans, we are studying humans in the deep past and to do that we use physics, chemistry, biology and we are actually fortunate uh, to use cutting-edge life sciences. So actually what we do is that we combine those two things. So basically we combine life sciences with the humanities. I also find it extremely useful for our students. I've uh, been to the site three times now, last year and this year I've been there two times. And I've done multiple things, but uh, this year I am focusing on excavating the front section. I've been excavating the first 10 centimeters of the section, so we can also uh, take some samples out. So basically I did my master in archaeological sciences, specialized in material culture studies. It's my first time that I am going to the cave for the, for the excavating there. My main uh, specialization in work was actually to microscopically assess uh, specific tool types. Basically, when I was a kid, I had a very nice teacher when I was in grade four, and I had a, already a pretty good, deep interest in history. And he would bring me old National Geographic magazines. And uh, that always stuck with me. And I would go home and read them over and over again. One day it kind of struck me like a lightning bolt that maybe this is something that I want to, to get back into and pursue properly. And the rest is history. Literally. Yeah, literally, yes, indeed. 
My specialization is uh, fauna, animal remains. I'm gonna do my my thesis on the impact of carnivores in the in the cave of Kinse, and we are especially doing in the back of the cave. We are doing a test pit, which is uh, digging uh, a square where we are gonna go all the way down to the base of the cave to see if there is anything interesting that we should continue excavating the rest of the back of the cave because no one has done it so far. So I ended up being archeologists in general because, well, partly, <laughs> partly of course, because of the Indiana Jones films, at least a little bit. Not as much as some other people I know, but it has, in every way, it's always, Indiana Jones has done a lot for a lot of archeologists. But it's also because I was always been interested in history, where I get to do something academic, I get to you know ask questions and figure out things, and I get to be outside, I get to dig, and it's I also get to answer these huge riddles. The cave, I'm working as a geoarchaeologist, and so my job basically is to understand the layers and the artifacts and uh, the context of the artifacts within those layers. But my specialization, studying for my PhD, is uh, the use of fire and uh, fire as a technology, pyrotechnology. And so uh, my studies focus primarily on understanding how ne late Neanderthals and modern humans use fire as a technology. It's pretty conclusive, to be honest, that uh, without fire we'd be stuck in the Stone Age. It, it's one of the greatest inventions of all time. We excavate very little at the site, extremely little. This is because we are using techniques that require very little sediment. But this is also because we know that in 20 years time, 50 years time, 100 years time, much more will be possible to do at that specific cave. Because the techniques we are using, those cutting edge techniques coming from the life sciences, will have again evolved. So one thing that is extremely important uh, that is uh, very important for us. One of the reasons we are here is that we want to date the occupation. We want to know exactly in time when those occupations happen. With C14, we can measure how old are those bones and then tell when Neanderthals were there. But we also want to uh, have all the type of measurements because it's, it's like if you only have one clock, it's very difficult to tell. Uh, what time is it exactly? Because maybe your clock is in late or in advance. So then it's better just to have several clocks. And if you have three of them, you probably have a very good idea of what time is it. We are going to take sediment sample and those sediment sample are going to be analyzed. And what they are going to check is the last time the, the, the small grain of sand in that sediment, the last time they saw the light. In order to do that, to take those samples, of course we cannot take those samples during the day because otherwise we would just date today. So what we do is that we come back at night, then we, we, use, we use a red light because the red light is actually not influencing the signal and then we take those sediments sample. I think what is really fascinating for me is the fact that we are one human population. A huge one with a lot of diversity, but one. And in the past, uh, it seems that we had different human population. And I, I just, I find this fascinating. If I had a time machine and I could go back there at the cave 40,000 years ago, I think I would like to ask the Neanderthals if they have seen other humans coming into their landscape. I want to know how did they interact with each other, how those two populations, those Neanderthals that have been in isolation for many years, many thousands of years maybe, how did they uh, receive and welcome those new peoples coming into their land and the other way around too. So what I would also like to do is to meet with one of those groups of early modern humans and ask them the same. Did you notice, do you notice that there are other people in the landscape, in the landscape? Have you met them already? What did you exchange with them? Were you interested in their technology? It is estimated that the number of Neanderthals, of adult Neanderthals, 40,000 years ago, was about around 
a few thousand, maybe three thousand, and this over Europe. The university I'm working, we are three thousand staff members. So the number of people working here in my university is the same number of today, the same number of people of Neanderthals who were walking around in the entire Europe 40,000 years ago. It seemed that our entry into Europe had something to do with the disappearance of Neanderthals. And I think it's important for us to understand how we were different to these past human groups and what in our behavior led to us being the last ones left. Considering the Neanderthals disappear from the record 40,000 years ago, it's, it's poetic and it's beautiful to know that they live on in many of us. And in many ways that is, for lack of a better term, the Neanderthal legacy is helping to shape the people that we are today. We also test the hypothesis that Homo sapiens became what it became, so us today, because at some point in time, 40,000 years ago in Europe, it did interbred with Neanderthals, and by doing so, he also interacted with Neanderthals, and he built upon the knowledge of Neanderthals. And that this is this intermingling, those interactions, that actually fostered the success of Homo sapiens. So we have this conception of Neanderthals as kind of brutish uh, ice age hunter gatherers, which maybe didn't indulge too much in complex behavior. This idea of them being brutish, sluggish, kind of not really human in a way is rapidly, rapidly evolving. And we're, we're learning through multiple lines of evidence that they were actually much more like us than we ever thought in the past. We have a tendency to think that the humans who are here today, Homo sapiens, must have been superior to the humans who disappeared. We think, when we think superior, we think co cognitively superior. We do not have evidence for this, direct evidence for this, in the archaeological record. So one of the things we try to do with, with my group is to reconstruct what happened in the past without imposing on the past this dominant point of view, this superiority point of view. We are the last species left. We shared the earth with people who were different to us. And now we are the last ones. We are the last ones left. Evidence is increasingly indicating that perhaps what happened is that the Neanderthal population of Europe was effectively absorbed into the population of modern humans who migrated into Europe around 40,000 years ago. I want to understand why we are all modern humans today and how did that, came, uh, how did that come to happen. In the past, the model was relatively simple, that there was this giant wave of migration of modern humans that came in and basically eradicated Neanderthals in Europe. I did a DNA test and uh, I have 4% of Neanderthal genes. So actually I have more than the mean, I am more Neanderthal than uh, um, the average uh, European. What is triggering my curiosity is to understand what did they gave us what is their legacy and how much of what we are today is constrained by that past, by, that, by those interactions with those people 40,000 years ago. Science has only yet uncovered the earliest of clues. As for the cave in Kensei and the team from Leiden University, the work will continue. Analyzing sediment, personal ornaments and stone tools to name but a few. With new discoveries being made all the time, what will the science of archaeology bring and how will this deepen our understanding? What work lies ahead for Marie Ceresi and her students as they discover more of our Neanderthal legacy?